Okay, um, I'm David Sepperly from the University of Illinois, and I'm going to give a, some overview talks this morning and tomorrow morning. So we're gonna start out for the first hour or so talking uh, in general about simulations, because this is where we learn about error bars, which are very important in Monte Carlo, as I'll say, and about Markov chains. Some people may not know what a Markov chain is or what Monte Carlo is, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, not in depth, but a little bit. And um, then, I'll, then I'll talk about error bars and error estimates, and this will be a theoretical background that you need for the labs this afternoon, where you're gonna talk more about how QMC pack implements errors. I'm gonna talk more theoretically, uh, but uh, this afternoon you'll talk more concretely about how you do it in the code, actually. I was supposed to give an overview about why you might wanna use QMC, but I decided, well, you guys are all here and you wanna learn about QMC, and we'll talk later about some applications about QMC, uh, so I'm not gonna go in a lot of detail but if you're coming from, say, the DFT world, you kind of think that DFT can explain everything about quantum mechanics, and in principle, it can explain everything, but in practice, DFT is a mean field theory, and it assumes that electrons don't interact with, you, with each other except through a mean field. Well, as quantum Monte Carlo is the opposite extreme, where we, assume that electrons are particles that interact, and it has more of a classical feel. As we'll see um, tomorrow, uh, Quantum Monte Carlo is based on Feynman's imaginary time picture of, of quantum mechanics, which maps quantum mechanics into a classical kind of model. In a way, this explains why Quantum Monte Carlo is the most general method for computing quantum properties. If you've ever learned classical statistical mechanics, you know that to, to calculate properties of a liquid, you have to do Monte Carlo molecular dynamics. For example, in biophysics, if they want to find a property of a polymer, you have to do molecular dynamics, right? It's just too complicated to do mean field. Well, mean field theory is not very accurate, and it's too complicated to do anything else than just a brute force simulation. Well, if you believe that, then you have to believe the same thing about quantum mechanics. There's no reason why quantum mechanics should be more simple than classical mechanics, right? And Feynman shows that you can map quantum mechanics into classical mechanics. So therefore, if you think that you need to do molecular dynamics to understand a protein, then you, under, you have to do something like molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo to do electrons in an atom or a molecule, if you want to do it accurately. Of course, the reason why methods like d density functional theory or Hartree-Fock work so well is that the correlation in many molecules is very weak. And the electrons can't mostly interact as with the mean field. But if you want to get more accurate, you're going to have to do a simulation. So in quantum Monte Carlo, we're representing the electrons as points and we're moving them around according to a random game. So, um, so as I was trying to say, the, this gives the most accurate method for general quantum minibody systems. You can do systems all the way from quarks, nuclei, electrons, liquid helium, um, uh, quantum Hall effect, all these things can be done within the same framework of quantum Monte Carlo. We're not gonna talk about all those different generalizations. In fact, down here I have a bunch of different methods. Uh, we're gonna today talk about variational Monte Carlo. Tomorrow we'll talk about projector Monte Carlo, and in fact, diffusion Monte Carlo. But we won't talk about these methods that work at finite temperature. But you know, we, we have codes that do these things, but we decided one week is enough to explore just this one method, the diffusion Monte Carlo method. Actually, QMC pack also does this reputation Monte Carlo, but I don't think we, we have any particular exercises about that today, I mean this week. Um, one of the advantages of quantum Monte Carlo is uh, that you can incorporate uh, not only the quantum effects of electrons, but also the ions, for example. We do a lot of work with 
liquid and solid hydrogen at high pressure, and there you can treat both the protons and the electrons in the same method simultaneously and get around the born op and not make the born oppenheimer approximation. And there'll be a talk by Norm Tubman on Friday concerning this, the, this, this approach. Uh, or you can do actually path integrals for the protons and uh, 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 diffusion Monte Carlo for the electrons. Uh, however, that doesn't work now with QMC packs, so we're not going to talk about this. So it's a very general method with lots of different variations. But this week, we're going to focus on just a few of the, of the techniques in, that you use in, in um, chemical physics or solid state physics or materials physics, uh, where you, basically these are T equals zero methods. By T equals zero, I mean where you're considering calculating the properties of a single quantum state, uh, many body state. Now, I switch into the overview about simulation. Uh, the, really, the, f the founding paper in this field is this famous paper by Metropolis, uh, 1953. You know, we say Metropolis, but life is not fair. It wasn't Metropolis that did this work. It was really the husband and wife team of the Rosenbluths, Ariana and Marshall Rosenbluth, that were junior scientists at the time that did the work. And Edward Teller, who you probably have Know, know about is the so-called father of the American hydrogen bomb. It, you're, if you ever watched Dr. Strangelove, you would recognize him. But he apparently, in his brilliance, uh, pushed these two people to develop this very radical method. 1953, you could imagine, uh, your com their computers that time were probably a million times slower than your cell phone. Um, and you know they managed it with a with 100K of, uh, uh, sorry, with a thousand um, pieces of memory, they managed to do this uh, random walk method. And if you could read the introduction, it says this is a general method that can be used to, um, it's, um, it's suitable for investigating properties of uh, consisting of individual molecules. So they recognized right away that this was a very general method that could be used to um, study properties of many body systems exactly. And I'm going to tell you a little later on to, uh, in this hour what we mean by exactly, right? Uh, we don't mean uh, that you compute things to 16 decimal places, but that you have uh, well-defined error bars. Uh, what is a Markov chain or a random walk? Basically, it's very simple. You have some abstract space that you're working in, some state space. From the point of view of this week, the state space will consist of electron positions. So a lot of the time we're going to be working with periodic boundary conditions. And so we have a box, a periodic box like a torus, and we have 100 electrons or a certain number of electrons. And the space that you're working in consists of the coordinates of the electrons. We're working in a coordinate representation. So if you have 100 electrons, and say the electrons can be in a box, say uh, 10 angstroms or on the side. And so you, know, you, you have to specify 300 coordinates. Uh, and that's your space, right? It's a very simple description of where the electrons are. A random walk is just simply a game, if you like, where the, the electrons move throughout this box according to a probabilistic rule, a random. So, you know, it's like a board game where you throw the dice and you move the particles around. Uh, Fermi actually described this at, uh, literally uh, that way back in the 1930s. Basically, so you, you have a space and you, you have some probability, which we call P, that says you move from one state to another state. S to S prime. It's a probability, so it's a, a non-negative number, the probability of going from S to S prime, and it's normalized like probabilities are. The probability of being in some state S prime is one, right? So these are the, the, this is, defines what a probability is and defines what a Markov process is. So a Markov process means that you, do, you only remember 
you, you, the rule only depends on where you are. You have no memory of the past. That's how, how does this different than molecular dynamics? Everybody, do some people know what molecular dynamics are, is? I hope, molecular dynamics is just Newton's equations of motion, right? What's the difference? Molecular dynamics is a deterministic process. So it's not probabilistic. So uh, there's no randomness that comes in. So that's much more difficult mathematically because it's deterministic. Markov realized more than 100 years ago that if you just make these simple assumptions that you can prove lots of theorems. You can prove that a Markov chain under certain conditions has to converge to a unique equilibrium distribution, okay? Um, so we talk about a probability distribution, which I called F here, and N is the number of steps in the random walk. So when we do uh, quantum Monte Carlo calculations, we will be doing uh, millions of steps of the random walk. So we start out with some arbitrary state that is, we put the electrons down in some state, and then we just randomly move them according to P. By random, be careful, I don't mean that there's no structure in P. I don't mean that P is a constant function. P is, you know, you move them according to some rules. Um, now, and so if you apply this rule millions of times, you ask the question, how does the problem, where do the particles go? What is the distribution of particles after many, many steps? That's the so-called equilibrium state. And that's a stationary distribution of P. So it's like an eigenvalue problem. I know that you all know what eigenvalues are. Sorry, this is at the bottom of the slide, but uh, th there is an equilibrium distribution. And you can show that if the random walk is ergodic, then it goes to a unique distribution, uh, and there, the eigenvalue is one, so they all converge. Now, what do we mean by ergodic? Ergodic means that you can go everywhere in uh, the phase space in a finite amount of time, basically. So again, I said our, our phase space for variational Monte Carlo is going to consist of the positions of the electrons inside the box. You have, you know, an infinite number of ways you could arrange the electrons, but if you think about it, after a finite number of steps, you can move the electrons anywhere you want. A finite number could be a thousand steps or whatever. You might think about this like a deck of cards. You know, you have 52 factorial arrangements of a deck of cards. The question is how quickly, how can you arrange the cards in any order you want by a certain amount of shuffling, right? Yes, you can, so it's ergodic. So if we shuffle a deck of cards many, many times, what do we end up with? We end up with a uniform distribution of cards, right? Where each 52 factorial arrangement of cards is equally probable. That's what ergodic means. Now there's another concept here, which is the correlation time, which is kappa which we'll define in a minute, and that is, in a given random walk, how long does it take to reach this equilibrium state? How many shuffles of the cards does it take? Ergodicity is often easy to prove, uh, and it's not usually a big problem in quantum Monte Carlo, ergodicity, although it is in classical problems. Now, here is the Metropolis algorithm that we're going to use in variational Monte Carlo. We sample by using an ergodic random walk. We fix the equilibrium state by using the so-called detailed balance condition. And what is detailed balance? That's this equation. Pi of s is the desired equilibrium state. For variational Monte Carlo, as I'll discuss the next hour, it's going to be the square of the wave function that we have. Pi of s is the equilibrium state we want to get it, go to. Now, I'm going to give you an example about classical Boltzmann distribution, where pi of s is the classical Boltzmann distribution. P of s at s prime 
is what I introduced earlier, is what is the probability of moving from one state to another state? So we put both of these in. Detailed balance means there's a rate balance from S to S prime versus the reverse rate, right? So that's this equation. The, the probability of being at S times the probability of moving from S to S prime has to equal the reverse, the probability of being at S prime and the probability of moving from S prime back to S. If you have this condition, and the walk is ergodic, then you can prove in a few lines of algebra that, um, that the state must go to pi. So this is how we put in information. This is how we relate the desired state that we want and the transition rules, right? Now, Metropolis' real uh, invention was how to do this, how to achieve detailed balance. And that's the third step here. It's called rejections. Basically, you reject steps according to a certain criteria. Okay. So the rejection method, you break up, number three here, you break up the transition probability into a sampling probability and an acceptance probability. Right? So that's what we call T is the probability that you sample a new point, and A is the probability that you accept it. Okay, so your transition probability is the product of these two things. It can be shown that the best way of accepting moves is through this famous formula. That is the acceptance, if you're moving from S to S prime, um, you calculate, it looks a little complicated, this formula here. It has a minimum of one. Why do we have the minimum in there? Can anybody tell me? You guys are going to go to sleep if you never said anything. Yes? Because it's got to be normalized. Close, very close. Not quite normalized. That's not the right word. But uh, you're on the right track. It has to do with probabilities. Okay, when you accept something, that is, we move from S to S prime with T, and we calculate this ratio here. It's got a T's on the top and the bottom and a pi on the top and the bottom. If you accept something, you compare it to a random number between 0 and 1, and A must be between 0 and 1. So it's not really normalized, but normalized would be uh, that the integral of something equals 1, but here it's saying that the probability has to be between 0 and 1. Um, and you put the minimum there. In the case that this ratio is greater than one, uh, you say, well, it's going to get accepted for sure, but it's not going to get accepted with a probability greater than one, which is impossible. So that's why the minimum's there. This is the probability of going in the forward direction. That is, S prime is the new point, S is the old point, and this is the probability of going in the reverse direction backwards, S prime to S, okay? Just explaining these symbols. Pi's are the probabilities that you want, the distribution that you want to sample. Metropolis is a general technique to sample any distribution that you can come up with. T is the sampling probability. For example, I'm going to give you two examples. This is the actual Metropolis method they moved from one point to another inside of a cube, and actually I have a picture. Oh, there I do have a picture. So maybe I explain this. Okay, here we have like 10 particles or so in a box. This is supposed to be a delta here. Uh, wrong font, but okay. We picked up this particle and we moved it randomly inside the black square so that T is constant inside the black square and zero outside. It would have to be normalized, like you say, so that the normalization would be one over delta cubed uh, inside the black square. That's what T would be for this particular example. I'm going to give you another example in a minute. Um, and so this was actually what Metropolis did in their uh, calculation back in 1953. So T is when you uh, 
in a metropolis procedure, you have a bunch of electrons. You move one of the electrons according to some probability distribution. That's T. Then you have to go in the backwards direction and say, if you went backwards from uh, S prime to S, what would T have been? That's what this is. You have to be able to calculate that. Now, in the metropolis procedure, where you moved it inside of a, a cube, they were, they, 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 it was constant, so these two factors canceled out. And that's why you have this equation, because T was a constant. And so this factor equals that factor and drops out. Pi is what you want to sample, the distribution that you want to sample. So that's how you put in that you want to sample the wave function. So does that answer your question? Right, you have a choice of what T is. That's, that's what you have a choice, and there's a best choice, and there's some worst choice, you know, good choices and bad choices. There's a trade-off, but that's this flexibility that you have. That is, you, you know, there's a perfect choice. In fact, I'll tell you, the perfect choice of T is pi. But that's impossible, because you don't know the normalization. Uh, not impossible. It's impossible for a real problem. I mean, you can make an artificial problem where it's possible, but in a real problem, you can't choose t equal to pi. Because the idea is you want to get the acceptance ratio high, because if you're always rejecting your steps, your random walk is not going anywhere. It's like somebody that goes to the grocery store and can't figure out what to buy, because there's too many choices. So, you know, you want, there's an optimization between moving through phase space um, and getting rejected, right? I mean, if you always are rejecting the move. So basically, we, okay, so enough, maybe I belaboring these points too much. This is, in case you're familiar with a classical picture, classical thing, we want to sample the Boltzmann distribution. This is the Boltzmann distribution. This is not quantum Monte Carlo, this is classical Monte Carlo. This is the Boltzmann distribution. You have energy as a function of where you are in phase space. KT is the temperature. You want to sample this distribution, pi of s, the Boltzmann distribution. And using this procedure that I talked about here, um, you know, this is the acceptance probability, is e to the minus the change in energy. Metropolis, they also made a very nice choice of what the potential energy was. They said there were hard spheres. So V is infinite or zero. And so they didn't actually have to compute this. They just moved these spheres around. And when any two spheres overlapped, they rejected. You can prove that that's sampling the Boltzmann distribution for a hard sphere system. So it's, they didn't have to, because the computers were so slow, they didn't have to, you know, they wanted to take the simplest possible V. Basically, you calculate uh, this e to the minus beta delta e, beta is the inverse temperature, and if you compare it to a random number, I called it un, a random number uniform in zero to one, and basically looking at this factor, if this is greater than one, we always accept it, and if it's less than one, we accept it uh, with probability e to the minus beta delta e. So if you really increase the energy, um, that is, delta E is very large and positive, then you're probably going to reject the move. But occasionally, you accept uphill moves, right? It's not like a steepest descent where you always go downhill. You go, it depends on the temperature. You go up and downhill, and occasionally you accept the uphill moves, and then, but you always accept downhill moves, and this is how then you, you sample the Boltzmann distribution. Or any distribution at all. So this is kind of a scheme, a very simple scheme of a Monte Carlo, a Metropolis Monte Carlo code. Okay? We have some function that initializes the state, that is, puts the electrons down in a box. Now, I said it could be arbitrary, but that's mathematically true. Even in QMC pack, if you put them in a really bad place, you may pay for it. It may cost you, okay? 
it's not good to rely too much on mathematics, right? <laughs> it's like the people that rely on the directions on the cell phone no matter what, right? You could get into trouble because it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> you may think, for example, a classic case, electrons are fermions. If you put two electrons at the same place, they're not supposed to be there according to the Pauli principle and then they will you'll get a divide by zero somewhere in your code and it will crash probably. Okay, that's an example. Also, if you have an atom that's on the order of one angstrom in size and you put an electron out at 10 to the third angstroms, it's going to take probably hours and hours for that electron to find its way back, right? That's physics. So, this is initializing the state. Okay, now we have a loop. This is the, a loop would be millions of steps, typically. It's a Markov chain. Okay, and so each element of the loop is you sample based on the old position, the new position, and you return this transition probability. This is the probability that you sampled. So you have some sampling function. I told you about the metropolis scheme. You calculate the new energy, then you have to calculate the backwards probability also, uh, and then you calculate the acceptance probability. Again, this is written for classical uh, uh, Boltzmann distribution. So I have the temperature. No, I don't have the temperature. I have the energy here. I, I assume the temperature is one, okay. Um, and then we compare the acceptance probability to a random number, which we call spring, but you know you could just call it RNG. And if you accept it, that means that you replace uh, the coordinates with the new coordinates, and you replace the energy with the new energy, and you calculate the acceptance probability, and you do your averaging, the properties that you want to calculate about the system. Now, there's a couple of important things about this. First of all, you always want to know what the acceptance probability is. When somebody says, oh, my variational Monte Carlo code doesn't work, the first thing I would ask them was, well, what was your acceptance probability? Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute, why you want to know that. You want to calculate a lot of, and okay, and another important point was um, uh, the, if, if you reject a step, you must count it in the statistics. For example, you go all along, your system is moving, and it gets stuck at one place for 10 steps. That place counts 10 times. And then it moves along and counts the new steps, right? If you don't do that, you get the wrong answer, okay? It's as simple as that. You're not doing uh, the statistics correctly. That's one of the reasons why you want to know what the acceptance probability is because, uh, you know, you, uh, obviously if it doesn't get accepted very often, you're not getting very much new information about, every, about uh, the random walk. You always measure the acceptance ratio uh, and there's always in variational Monte Carlo a step size. We call it the time step, for example. This is the parameter. That's the only parameter that you have to control, but you have to control it, right? And the rule is that you want to adjust the parameter to control the acceptance ratio. And the rule is, very often people say one half, but what they actually mean is the acceptance ratio should be between 10% and 90%, not one half. There's nothing special about one half. These are some figures. This shows you. Um, this shows you how the acceptance probability depends on the step size. And okay, what do we see physically here? If you have a really small step size, your acceptance ratio goes up to 100 percent. This is actually a good test of the program. Uh, if what would it mean? if when your step size goes to zero, if the acceptance probability did not go to 100%, what would that tell you about your program? 
What? Somebody raise their hand so I can see where you are. Okay, back there. Newton's law? Uh, yes, but maybe somebody could be more convergence. detailed. No, not convergence. Another, I saw some other hands back here. Somebody else? So the idea that you're moving, you're moving an infinitesimal distance, say 10 to the minus 6. The acceptance ratio is not 1. What goes into the acceptance ratio? Two things, the old energy and the new energy. So you're moving an infinitesimal distance and you're getting a different energy. That's not physically correct, right? The energy should be a smooth function of the state. I guess it would be possible if you had discontinuous functions, but wave functions are not discontinuous, so we don't have, so that, that would actually be a test of your code. In fact, well, I, I switched, sorry, I switched over. You know, it should go sort of linearly to zero or something like that. Uh, in a smooth fashion, um, or, poly or quadratically to zero. Now, why does the acceptance ratio go to zero for large step size? It doesn't have to, by the way, but it could. Okay, the idea is you're taking a system where a large step size moves, you're throwing the electron far away. Usually that's not so good. It could be good, but usually, like, if you have a molecule, you throw it far away, the electron is leaving the molecule, the wave function should go to zero, and you should reject that step. It's unphysical. Okay. So this is the general shape of the curve. Um, and this is actually the diffusion constant. This is how far you're moving on the average. Um, it's a function of step size. And see, this is, and it illustrates, these are different methods, by the way, but I, I can't explain them yet. But take any given method. The idea is if you make a really s small step size, you always accept it, but you don't go very far, right? So this is like a really cautious person that just goes, takes a little tiny steps. It doesn't get very far, but he never runs into trouble, right? On the other hand, if you move really far, the acceptance ratio goes to zero because you're throwing the particle maybe off the molecule or something like that. So there's a maximum, that's the point. There's a maximum in between, and that's this, where this rule comes in, right? And so the idea is, um, if you look over here, 10% and 90%, well, that was supposed to be these two arrows, I guess, here. But anyway, there's some range uh, of, a probability that corresponds to be at the max. It doesn't matter if you're exactly at the maximum, because this is something like the efficiency of the Monte Carlo, right? And it's flat at the maximum. So it, you don't really have to be exactly at the maximum, but you know, it's, uh, it, it, you don't want to be down here, or you don't want to be down here. That's the only thing. Here's actually the variance, that, which we'll talk about. And you can see the variance really doesn't depend on the step size. You know, you get about the same variance. So that's because Monte Carlo is a very robust method. You don't want to have an acceptance ratio of 10 to the minus 3. But if you have anything at all in the right range, it's, it's going to work OK. And you see that this is the, actually the efficiency of the Monte Carlo. It doesn't really matter what the step size is. But if you were over here at 0, it would matter, right? You would be in bad shape, or over here, right? You don't need to fine tune things. Actually, why would you want to study the step size? Anybody have an answer? Besides, uh, besides what I just said, there's another reason which we, we want to be a theme of the workshop. Why? Yes? Somebody answer, why would you want to study the step size? No, I was thinking about something even more fundamental. I was thinking about testing the code. The answer in Monte Carlo is independent of the step size. The error bars are not independent of it. 
you can run here at this step size and that step size. If you get the same answer, you have at least a little confidence that your code is working, that there's not a bug in the code, right? I mean, QMC pack presumably would pass this test, uh, that the answer would be independent of the step size. Uh, but if you write your own QMC code, this is the place where you find your errors, right? Uh, that, that's kind of a simple test that you can do. Change the step size, and if the answer changes, you're in trouble, right? You know that for sure there's a bug. Um, I think, oh, going really slowly, in what sense do we calculate exact properties? The answer is, if we average long enough, the error goes to zero. In that sense, the errors are controlled. And you can see you can achieve fairly, because computers are so powerful, you can get, get rather small error bars, right? We do not calculate things to um, many, many decimal places, but we have error bars. That's unique amongst Monte Carlo, amongst methods. I mean, if you ask a density functional theory calculation, what are the errors of the density functional? There's no answer, right? I mean, the only answer is to compare with the experiment or uh, compare with other calculations. But we have the advantage in, in some Monte Carlo calculations at least that we actually have an internally computed error bar. The error bar, the trouble is of course, that the error bar goes as one over uh, the square root of the number of steps. So if you calculate things to four decimal places in one hour, it's gonna take 10 hours to calculate it uh, I'm sorry, 100 hours to calculate it to five decimal places, right? So that's slow. That's the curse of Monte Carlo. But the advantage is you can calculate errors. Um, I don't know if I need to say this, but you should never, you should calculate error bars for everything that you care about, or everything that's important. Without the error bars, you have no idea what the significance of the result is, right? It's just like an experiment. Um, you should be able to understand the formulas that I'm going to talk about and make an error bar, make it what I call an eyeball error bar, um, estimate of the error bar. Here is a trace, what I call a trace of a simulation. What's, here is some quantity like the energy, right? And here are the number of steps. So we have, it starts off here. And this part I kind of hashed out here is the transient part. That's the part that you throw away. And again, there's no formula that tells you what to throw away. But you can see that there's a part here at the beginning which did not ever occur again. So that was the transient, right? And then it fluctuates. And some people think that it should stop fluctuating after a while. That's what DFT would do, but Monte Carlo never stops fluctuating. You could go on for a million years and would keep fluctuating like this. But our answer converges. That is, the average value converges um, versus the number of steps. And so that's the error bar, is the estimated error and the estimated mean. By estimated, we mean calculated based on the simulation. So we have an estimate, that's Monte Carlo jargon, of how you calculate an integral, right? The energy or some other property. That's the average value. So you can see I drew a line here. So you can see here the average value is 2.25 or whatever. And here is the histogram of the energy and that shows you the fluctuations. And as I said, the fluctuations go on forever. It never stops fluctuating. But what converges is our estimate of what the mean value is. And we get more and more information. We know better and better what the mean is. And we determine both the mean and the errors based on these fluctuations, right? Now, the theorem that this is based on is called the central limit theorem of Gauss. And here's actually proof of it, but I don't know if we need to go, probably a lot of you know what the central limit theorem is. 
Um, but basically the idea is that if you have a number of independent samples uh, and you calculate the mean, if F is the distribution of the independent sample, so F would be uh, this distribution here, the distribution of the energy, say, um, and you sum up n values of, of the energy, and if they're uncorrelated, then if n is large enough, the distribution of the mean must converge to a Gaussian distribution. That's the central limit theorem. And so it must converge to this, and, um, and it has a standard error as uh, sigma. It's a theorem. Theorems always have conditions, and the condition on the central limit theorem is that the variance of your distribution has to be finite. And so the variance is, uh, well, I'll define it in a, in a minute, but it's the second moment of the distribution. So that's why we want our Monte Carlo estimates to have finite variance. Once they have finite variance, you know that in the long term, the central limit theorem must be obeyed. And then we talk about ones, about standard deviations of errors, and uh, you know, like what is the probability that you get a two sigma event or a four sigma event. That's all based on the central limit theorem. Um, so here is just showing the central limit theorem graphically. Suppose you start out with a square distribution like this. Here is a Gaussian with the same second moment. Suppose you add two random numbers together. You get a triangular distribution. You can see it already looks more like a Gaussian. Here is if you add four of them together. You see four random numbers added together looks almost indistinguishable from a, a Gaussian distribution. So that's the idea. Is that's why we can assign error bars and probabilities to our results. Now, the conditions are, I think I said this already, f of x, again, is the distribution of the quantity you're calculating. You can talk about the moments of the distribution, x to the n. And, okay, so in particular, we're interested in the first, the zero first and second moment. Uh, if I0 or I1 do not exist, this integral, then you've, your physics is incorrect. Either you have an unnormalized distribution or you have one where the energy is not defined, right? That's, that's a physical error. But a Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo requires all three of these moments to exist. I0, I1, and I2. I2 is the finite variance, that's x squared. Now, why would the variance not exist? This has to do with usually long, t long tails in the distribution. That is, the probability of getting a very large energy or very small energy. It, you have these rare events uh, where you can get very large energies or very small energies, and this can re result in infinite variance. And um, that means your error bars that you quote are not reliable. Uh, so I, I have an example, and I think actually in the lab, don't we have some examples in the lab? Is William here? Or Okay, so you're going to run into this in the lab, so you should listen, right? So here is actually, well, I don't have, sorry, I forgot. You'll see in the lab some results of, of, um, infinite variance. But here are two more traces that I showed. And why I bring these up is to show you what we mean by correlation in the data. This is uncorrelated data. So again, this is a thousand steps. They're both a thousand steps. And this, we're plotting basically the energy versus step, right? What's the difference between the right graph and the left graph? You should be able to see this by eye. You see how this is densely packed and going up and down? This is like noise on your old-fashioned television set, white noise. Over here, there's correlation in the data. You can see features. You can see white space in here. You see, for example, 
when this peak goes up, it stays up for a while and then comes down. Okay, how do we quantify that? We quantify that in terms of the autocorrelation function. It's plotted down here. You can't see the scale. Over here is the autocorrelation function for the audit uncorrelated data. It's 1 at t equals 0 and it's 0 afterwards. That's uncorrelated data. I'll define this in a minute. Correlated data starts out at 1, but it doesn't get to 0 to about 10 or 20 steps. The area under this curve is called the autocorrelation time. This mathematically quantifies what we mean by correlated data. So here is actually how we estimate errors in the quantum Monte Carlo. The first box is uncorrelated data. This you should be familiar with when you took physics lab and you had to calculate error bars on your experiments, right? So basically we have some time series, A of t. t is the number of steps in the random walk. And you want to calculate the mean. Well, that's easy. You just take the average value over the random walk, right? What is the error? Well, we estimate the error by the fluctuations about the mean, right? So that's this formula here. Delta A is the fluctuation about the mean, and we look at the, the average size of the fluctuations, so that would account for this n here. And then we divide by an extra factor of n, well, because the, our knowledge is increasing as we get more data, and you know, we have an extra factor of n. But anyway, and you have an n minus 1. The minus 1 is not really very important, although it should be there if you only have like 10 data points, but otherwise it doesn't really matter. But um, it's there because you're determining both the mean value and the errors from the same data set. Uh, if, if, you, if somebody told you the mean value was zero, for example, you would need to put that minus one in there. Um, but anyway, th this is the formula for uncorrelated data. For correlated data, you have one additional factor, which is this kappa, which is the correlation time. The central limit theorem still applies to correlated data, uh, but you have to take into account the correlation time, kappa. And kappa is how quickly the fluctuations in the, in the quantity you're estimating decrease in time, right? So that's what this quantity here is the, correla is the correlation function. And uh, you, you calculate it, and so going back to this is the fluctuation at time t times the fluctuation at time zero. Basically, looking at this, you would calculate the, fl the fluctuation would be the size uh, of the function relative to the mean value. So this is the positive fluctuation. You calculate the value here, and then you calculate it at successive times, and you would take the average value. And that's what this function is, the autocorrelation time. Right? And and then this formula says the area under that curve is the correlation time. And that's what goes into our estimate of the error of A. Right? So what it's saying is the correlation time, actually, I can almost read it here. It's 11. I can just read that. The area under this curve is 11 steps. So that means we don't have 1,000 independent measurements we make. We only have 1,000 divided by 11, or we only, this data set only really has 90-some independent data points. So when we calculate the error bars, we shouldn't divide by 1,000, we should only divide by 90. Because, now, why was Monte Carlo, why is Monte Carlo data correlated at all? Does anybody know why? Go back to the Metropolis algorithm. Why is it correlated? Yes? Because it starts from a configuration and moves step by step by configuration, the next configuration. Yeah. So they come back. It takes a yeah, yeah. they have some way they come back then. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. The yeah? Well aren't these time sizes uh more likely correlate to uncorrelated? Yes, exactly. 
That's the trade-off between small step size and large step size. Except, if you make a large step size and it always gets rejected, it becomes correlated. So that's the trade-off. You want to increase the step size until it starts becoming more correlated. That was what I was showing in that curve, that there's a max, there's a maximum efficiency in terms of step size. What he said was, the reason why Monte Carlo data is correlated is that you're moving around in phase space and it takes a certain number of steps to get to a new place in phase space. And that's the correlation time. In this case, it was 11 steps. This is for the energy. Every quantity could have a different correlation time. But mostly we talk about the energy, the correlation time of the energy, right? If you talked about some other measure, you know, say the dipole moment of a molecule or quadrupole moment or something like that, you, you might get a different correlation time. You really should look at these things um, and understand what they are. Uh, it, there's two aspects. One, you should understand mathematically what this is. Second, you have to understand what the words mean so you can talk to somebody about it. Here is actually the proof of the correlation time. Sometimes I hear actually that the central limit theorem does not apply to Monte Carlo because of correlation. And that's, that's simply not true. Um, it's just that you have to take correlation into account when you calculate error bars. Um, and of course, there is an assumption that the correlation time is finite. I mean, if this kappa, which is this integral, was infinite, then it's true, the central limit theorem wouldn't apply. That would be the case if, as somebody mentioned back there, if you got trapped, your Monte Carlo got trapped in a certain place, the correlation time would be infinite, and it's true that your error bars would be incorrect. But anyway, this is the proof, actually, of this formula, but I won't go through the algebra. It looks like you couldn't even see the indices, which are kind of important in the proof. Uh, but it's just a basic property, you know, a, a derivation of a few lines of algebra of that formula. Uh, I wanted to define the efficiency. The efficiency of a Monte Carlo is the figure of merit. It tells you how fast the error bars are going to zero. That's the efficiency. So in fact, the efficiency, zeta, is 1 over the computer time times the variance, the error bars, squared. So why do we write this? Well, this should be independent of how long you run it. That is, you run it for one hour or 10 hours or whatever, the efficiency should be the same, right? Because the computer time grows and the variance decreases the same rate, right? And so the efficiency, of course, depends on the computer, the algorithm, the property, right? So if, you, if you, somebody comes up with a fancy new algorithm, you can compare efficiencies, right? Yes? Well, that's up to you. It compare, I would say it depends on what you're getting charged for, right? <laughs> you could put here, you could put here how much, you know, what are you getting charged for on the computer you're running? That's what really matters to you, right? You could put dollars here if you want. I don't know. You know, it depends on what's important to you. I mean, if the, in the old days, I don't know if, Anybody charges for computer time anymore, but you know, we used to get charged like $1,000 an hour, right? And th that would be the measure that would be important, right? But uh, this is if you, well, just imagine somebody was, had two different computers they were trying to sell you. One was $5,000 and had certain chip, and another was $12,000 and it had another fancy chip. See, so you could run your algorithm on that for one year and one year, and you could compare them, and you could see which one you should buy, right? That's how you use this formula. Or if you have two different algorithms or two different compilers or whatever. But we're going to use it also when you talk about wave functions, like 
We have one wave function that has a lower variance than the other wave function, but takes twice as long to compute each step. Then this is the formula that you use. Decide which is advantageous, right? Now, this is statistical error. That is, that's the Monte Carlo error. That is not usually the dominant error in our calculation. There are systematic errors. And, you know, the systematic errors are caused by lots of things. Round-off error, nonlinearities, bugs, non-equilibrium, uh, you know, bad algorithms or whatever. And so the difference is statistical errors will go to zero, but systematic errors won't go to zero. Yes? No, K, K, I'm sorry, my notation, K, kappa 2 here, this was just the, um, uh, the second moment of the distribution. I said you have to learn some vocabulary in order to talk to people, especially in the lab. Okay, so you have to know what these different words mean. The trace, I refer, is that picture that we had before of things fluctuating, right? Right? It's really useful to look at these things. What really bugs me is when students come in and say, my energy is 2.16. I, it doesn't mean anything, right? I can look at this graph and I can say right away, ha, huh, you got correlation here, no correlation there. There's so much more information. One number is useless, right? A function is more useful, okay. That's the trace. Equilibration time, I explained that. That's the part you throw away in the beginning, the warm-up. It's like when you buy a new laptop and you have to charge the battery for three hours. It's something you do in the beginning and then you throw it away, right? I'm not the laptop, but the data. Uh, histogram of values, that's the distribution of energies, right? And that's where you look for your tails, bad tails, bad spikes. The mean value of A, that's what you're trying to compute. That's the answer, right, the mean. The variance, that is the fluctuations in the distribution, right? These things are constant, independent of how long the run is. This is the variance, we'll talk about the variance of a wave function. The estimate of the mean, that is, this is just the average value. The estimate of the variance, um, the autocorrelation, I showed you what the autocorrelation function is, the correlation time that we want to compute is the error bar. That's the estimated error of the estimated mean. That's what you quote in your paper. You said you computed the energy 2.16 plus or minus 0.02. That's the 0.02, that's the estimate. And then you look up, you say how that's one standard deviation. You can look up the probability table for two sigmas, three sigmas, whatever. And then the efficiency I explained already, that's the efficiency of your Monte Carlo. Um, now, statistical thinking can be a little slippery. Um, I explained about the energy doesn't settle down to a constant. It's not like DFT where you iterate and your energy goes to a constant value. It fluctuates forever. It's our, our knowledge of the mean which converges, which we get more better uh, estimates of. As I explained before, this is not correct. The central limit theorem is valid, but you have to take correlation into account. Um, this is one of my bet noirs, the uh, cumulative energy. People plot the cumulative energy in papers. Whenever I see a paper, that has the cumulative energy, I tell them to get rid of that figure. Uh, because you can have all sorts of non-convergence and cumulative energy looks like it converges. Cumulative energy means you plot the integral from the beginning of the run of the average value and see how it converges. But when you integrate something, it smooths it out so that all of the bad things get smoothed over and you can't see them. So I don't, don't show me cumulative energies. I want to see the original data, not the smoothed out data. Okay, here's a question. Data set A differs from B by two error bars. Therefore, it must be different. When do you see this? When you're testing your code. You have a code, 
you have a result in the literature that says a certain energy and a certain error bar, and you run the calculation and you get a different answer. Should you be concerned? Well, I say the answer, no. You shouldn't be too concerned. You should be concerned, but it shouldn't stop you. Because this is normal in one out of 10 cases. It, if things always agree perfectly, you know they're cheating, right? In fact, I can't tell you how many times students have come in. I, I thought there was going to be a blackboard here. But you know, you come in, and somebody shows me a graph like this. Say, ah, I have a perfect linear dependence. But I know they're cheating, right? Because the line goes through the data error bars. That the probability of that is zero. Well, very, very small. A, a, a correct one would have points like this. And there are, if you look in numerical recipes or something, you'll see how to, to calculate the probability. It's called a chi-squared test. You calculate the chi-squared and you look up the chi-squared and you find out the probability that that's happening, right? And, you know, you should, you should, you should know a little bit about this, but, um, so what do you do when it differs by two error bars? What could you do to convince yourself that things are either right or wrong? Um, the central limit theorem applies. The problem in simulations, the data is correlated in time. You have to run long enough that you get independent data points. Suppose you take a run like this and it's coming down like this. That doesn't work. You don't know this is in equilibrium. You have to run like that. You can't, you, you have to run, if this is the, if this is the autocorrelation time here, you have to run at least 10 times kappa, like I showed here. And you need at least 10, I said here on the slide, I said you need at least 25 data points in order to estimate errors, independent ones. Uh, and that is to get the error accurate to 20%. This is the error accurate to 20%, not the value of the energy, but the error of the energy, because that's the square root of that 25. So it's like I, I was saying here, if this is the correlation time, in order to get reasonable errors, you're going to need to run 25 kappa. But that's usually not a problem with quantum Monte Carlo. You usually uh, run long time, but sometimes you run into problems.